Society, Masonic Temple, Chicago, Illinois. And we all know, if you don't know who Hermie Trismegistus is, I would implore you to read up on him and look into him. But I'm going to go to chapter four, I think it is, I think chapter four, and it's the all of the Kabbalion. And it begins. The all, under and back of, the universe of time, space and change, is ever to be found the substantial reality, the fundamental truth, the Kabbalion. Substance means that which underlies all outward manifestations, the essence, the essential reality, the thing in itself, etc. Substantial means actually existing, being the essential element, being real, etc. Reality means the state of being real, true, enduring, valid, fixed, permanent, actual, etc. Under and behind all outward appearances of manifestations, there must always be a substantial reality. This is the law. Man, considering the universe, of which he is a unit, sees nothing but change in matter, forces, and mental states. He sees that nothing really is, but that everything is becoming and changing. Nothing stands still. Everything is being born, growing, dying. The very instant a thing reaches its height, it begins to decline. The law of rhythm is in constant operation. There is no reality 
enduring quality, fixity, or substantiality in anything. Pardon me, substantiality in anything. Nothing is permanent but change. He sees all things evolving from other things and resolving into other things. A constant action and reaction, inflow and outflow, building up and tearing down, creation and destruction, birth, growth, and death. Nothing endures but change. And if he be a thinking man, he realizes that all of these things changing must be outward appearances or manifestations of some underlining power, substantial reality. All thinkers in all lands and in all times have assumed the necessity for postulating the existence of this subst substantial reality. All philosophies worthy of the name have been based upon this thought. Men have given to this substantial reality many names. Some have called it by the term of deity under many titles and parentheses. Others have called it the infinite and eternal energy. Others have tried to call it matter, but all have acknowledged its existence. It is self-evident. It needs no argument. In these lessons, we have followed the example of some of the world's greatest thinkers, both ancient and modern, the Hermetic masters, and have called this underlying power, this substantial reality, by the Hermetic name of the All which term we consider the most comprehensive of the many terms applied by man to that which transcends names and terms. We accept and teach the view of the great hermetic thinkers of all times, as well as of those illuminated souls who have reached higher planes of being, both of whom assert that the inner nature of the all is unknowable. This must be so, for not by the all itself can comprehend its own nature and being. The Hermeticists believe and teach that the all in itself is and must ever be unknowable. They regard all of the theories, guesses, and speculations of the theologians and metaphysicians, or metaphysicians regarding the inner nature of the all as but the childish efforts of mortal minds to grasp the secret of the infinite. Such efforts have always failed and will always fail from the very nature of the task. One pursuing such inquiries travels around and around in the labyrinth of thought until he is lost to all sane reasoning, action or conduct and is utterly unfitted for the work of life. He is like the squirrel which frantically runs around and around the circling treadmill wheel of his cage traveling ever and yet reaching nowhere. At the end, a prisoner still and standing just where he started. And still more presumptuous are those who attempt to ascribe to the all, the personality, qualities, properties, characteristics, and attributes of themselves, ascribing to the all the human emotions, feelings, and characteristics, even down to the pettiest qualities of mankind, such as jealousy and susceptibility to flattery and praise, desire for offerings and worship, and all the other survivals from the days of the childhood of the race. Such ideas are not worthy of grown men and women and are rapidly being discarded. At this point, it may be proper for me to state that we make a distinction between religion and theology, between, <clears throat> excuse me, between philosophy and metaphysics. Religion to us means that 
intuitional realization of the existence of the all. Pardon, let me go back. Religion to us means that intuitional realization of the existence of the all and one's relationship to it, while theology means the attempts of men to ascribe personality, qualities, and characteristics to it. Their theories regarding its affairs, will, desires, plans, and designs, and their assumptions of the office of middlemen between the all and the people. Philosophy to us means the inquiry after knowledge of things knowable and thinkable, while unknowable and unthinkable, and with the same tendency as that of theology. And consequently, both like broken reeds rooted in the quicksands of ignorance and affording naught but the most insecure support for the mind or soul of man. We do not insist upon our students accepting these definitions. We mention them merely to show our position. At any rate, you shall hear very little about theology and metaphysics in these lessons. But while the essential nature of the all is unknowable, there are certain truths connected with its existence which the human mind finds itself compelled to accept. And an examination of these reports from a proper subject of inquiry, particularly as they agree with the reports of the illuminated or higher plane. And to this inquiry, we now invite you. That which is the fundamental, fundamental truth, the substantial reality, is beyond true naming. But the wise men call it the all, the Kabbalion. In its essence, the all is unknowable, the Kabbalion. But the report of reason must be hospitably received and treated with respect, the Kabbalion. The human reason whose reports we must accept so long as we think at all, informs us as follows regarding the all, and that without attempting to remove the veil of the unknowable. The all must be all that really is. There can be nothing existing outside of the all, else the all would not be the all. The all must be infinite, for there is nothing else to define confine, bound, limit, or restrict the all. It must be infinite in time or eternal. It must have always continuously existed, for there is nothing else to have ever created it. And something can never evolve from nothing. And if it had ever not been, even for a moment, it would not be now. It must continuously exist forever, for there is nothing to destroy it, and it can never not be, even for a moment, because something can never become nothing. It must be infinite in space. It must be everywhere, for there is no place outside of the all. It cannot be otherwise than continuous in space, without break, succession, separation, or interruption, for there is nothing to break, separate, or interrupt its continuity and nothing with which to fill in the gaps. It must be infinite in power or absolute, for there is nothing to limit, restrict, restrain, confine, disturb, or condition it. It is subject to no other power, for there is no other power. The all must be immutable or not subject to change in its real nature, for there is nothing to work changes upon it, nothing into which it could change, nor from which it could have changed. It cannot be added to nor subtracted from, increased nor diminished, nor become greater or lesser in any respect whatsoever. It must have always been and must always remain. Just what is now the all? There has never been. 
is not now and never will be anything else into which it can change. The all being infinite, absolute, eternal, and unchangeable, it must follow that everything finite, changeable, fleeting, and conditioned cannot be the all. And as there is nothing outside of the all in reality, then any and all such finite things must be as nothing in reality. Now do not become defiled, nor frightened. We are not trying to lead you into the Christian science field under cover of hermetic philosophy. There is a reconciliation of this apparently contradictory state of affairs. Be patient, we will reach it in time. We see around us that which is called matter, which forms the physical foundation for all forms. Is the all merely matter? Not at all. Matter cannot manifest life or mind, and as life and mind are manifested in the universe, the all cannot be matter, for nothing rises higher than its own source. Nothing is ever manifested in an effect that it is not in the cause. Nothing is evolved as a consequence that it is not involved as a antecedent or an antecedent. Uh, antecedent. A N T E C E D E N T. And I hope I'm saying that right. I pray I do. I'm not trying to butcher that. <laughs> and then modern science informs us that there is really no such thing as matter. That which we call matter is merely interrupted energy or force that is energy or force at a low rate of vibration as a recent writer has said matter has melted into mystery even material science has abandoned the theory of matter and now rests on the basis of energy that's important we see a lot of that that can be backed up that is true then is the all mere energy or force? Not energy or force as the materialists use the terms, for their energy and force are blind, mechanical things devoid of life or mind. Life and mind can never evolve from blind energy or force. For the reason given a moment ago, nothing can rise higher than its source, nothing is involved unless it is involved. Nothing manifests in the effect unless it is in the cause. And so the all cannot be mere energy or force. For if it were, then there would be no such thing as life and mind in existence. And we know better than that. For we are alive and using mind to consider this very question. And so are those who claim that energy or force is everything. What is there then higher than matter or energy that we know to be existent in the universe? Life and mind. Life and mind in all their varying degrees of unfoldment. Then you ask, do you mean to tell us that the all is life and mind? Yes and no is our answer. If you mean life and mind as we poor petty mortals know then, we say no, the all is not that. But what kind of life and mind do you mean, you ask? The answer is living mind. As far above that which mortals know by those words as life and mind are higher than mechanical forces or matter. Infinite living mind as compared to finite life and mind. We mean that which the illuminated souls mean when they reverently or reverently pronounce the word spirit. The all is infinite living mind. The illuminated call it spirit. So that was coming from the Hermetic philosophies, uh, the three initiates, and that was chapter four. And the next time we come on, we'll be getting into chapter five, 
the mental universe, but that was the all. And it's to say that, you know, uh, uh, again, the all is mine, and the subconscious and the conscious, and the subconscious would be all, all that encompass everything. And we can, you know, tap into that. And once we figure out that we can tap into the subconscious mind, we can bring anything about because all that is in the subconscious mind is all that is going to be manifested. So we use them uh, and use that as uh, lessons to uh, manifest things that we want or manifest uh, things that we need. And I would say, you know, look into that, not saying, you know, anything about you know, Christianity or, or Buddhism or Judaism or because we all are inside that. That is, that is all encompassed into that. Um, again, I want to say uh, thank you to Prophet Sheikh Sharif Abdul Ali. This is a solar return. I feel compelled to do that. And I will always give love and honor to my great brother um, back then and even now. Uh, I want to show and send him love um, and, and all the prophets before him. And of course, I say, look up into the Hermetic philosophy, uh, look into that and uh, check it out. It's a really good read. And when we come back on here, I will drop uh, again, uh, five, chapter five. And uh, it's a really, really good read, family. Uh, it's a really, really good read. So uh, again, uh, I wanna give thanks and honor to all the family. Thanks and honor to all Moors worldwide. Um, Again, please uh, look out for yourself and each other. All right? Peace.